And since that was all inadvertent, we never do this around here, but I think it would be a great day for us to thank this faculty for their faithfulness through the years and what they do. Great. Won't help your grades, but it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Bill mentioned uh, Harold Honer and he knowing each other all these years. What you don't know is that Harold's about deaf in his left ear. He's been listening to that trumpet for about 40 years. And <laughs> if he just changed seats, it would help, but he always sits right there. Warm welcome to all of you who are looking at the school. It's a big decision, and you have to determine if it's really what God would have you do. We would have you do it, and if you ask us, we're all biased, so uh, you'd get the expected predicted answer, predictable answer, but you wait on God, and he'll make it clear to you what you should do. Because... Uh, you will invest years of your life here, and you will form habits for ministry. You will watch and admire and stand and sit alongside and in front of these faculty members who will shape your thinking, uh, not only about ministry, but about the scriptures and how to handle God's word. And so your decision is a, is a huge one. So take your time. It's uh, too important to rush into that decision. I want to talk to you today about God's school, which is a sacred school, and it goes on not only while you are here, but through the years that will stretch out in front of you. And um, in God's school, that curriculum um, never has a vacation. It goes on all the time. Let me set that up by saying when I was a first-year student here back in 1959, one of the guest preachers was uh, Alan Redpath, who was at that time a uh, pastor of Moody Church up in Chicago. Can't remember what he was talking on, but I do remember and will never forget one statement he made that I have quoted on a number of occasions in my own ministry of now just about 45 years. He said, when God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible person and crushes him. God's school is a sacred school of brokenness where we learn what the Lord revealed to Paul as he was writing somewhere in Macedonia that second letter to the Corinthians that my, my grace is sufficient. Um, my strength is perfected in your weakness. Now, uh, the problem comes in the school that God conducts in dealing with us because most of us do not really, truly believe that truth. We, we run from crushing. We resist it. And uh, if you have been through some of it already, and I know if you have been in the Lord for very long, you've already begun that school uh, then you know pretty much what I'm going to say. Uh, God seems to take delight in cutting his servants down to size so that in that spirit of genuine and true weakness, brokenness, and humility, he is able to use us 
and minister, literally minister through us. I want to talk about that. I want to say it enough and just enough for you to hear it and not forget it. Even if we never see each other again, I hope you never forget what you hear this morning. God's desire is to remove from us all of the crutches that we have learned to lean on to get through the schooling of the past or to get through trials, to get through uh, impossibilities. God's desire is to remove all crutches but himself. His plan is to force us to stop relying on the flesh so that we might start relying on the Spirit. It's an intriguing study to see how God took many of his uh, servants through this who are mentioned in the Scriptures. I'm going to choose one today, and in choosing this one, I'm overlooking a half dozen others whose lives illustrate this uh, just as clearly. Perhaps not quite as eloquently as this life. But here we will find the classic study of brokenness. The story begins in this man's life, uh, actually before he ever was made aware that he would be used of God in any way. He was simply the youngest in a family of eight boys, and uh, being the youngest, uh, it's doubtful that the thought of being a leader ever entered his mind. He kept his father's sheep, and he was faithful at that. Uh, for all we know, he did not spend all his nights under the roof of Jesse's home, but perhaps lived in the field and learned how to handle himself there very well. Prior to anything significant happening to him, a king was ruling who had proven himself an unfaithful monarch, even though he was the king of Israel. After not one, not two, but the third significant failure, a prophet named Samuel, older than the king, arrived on the scene and confronted the man with the truth that came directly from God through the prophet. You have disqualified yourself from sustaining the role of king over my people. And I'm referring to 1 Samuel 15. If you have a Bible, I'd like you to turn to that 15th chapter, verse 26, and then we will skip after a couple of three verses here into the story of David. And the unique way God used Saul in David's life. Uh, 1 Samuel 15, 26, Samuel said to Saul, remember, Saul is the king, the first king, human king of the people of the Hebrews. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord. Now please observe, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. It, it's a very clear and uh, uh, obvious statement, you're through. The hand of blessing lifts off you. Samuel turned to go and Saul seized the edge of his robe and it tore. So Samuel said to him, the Lord has torn the kingdom of Israel from you today. Today, note that, and has given it to your neighbor who is better than you. I don't know if you've seen that before. It, it uh, sort of struck me in a surprising way as recently as last night when I was looking this over again. As often as I've spoken on it, I don't know that I had ever 
taken in those last few words. He's better than you. That's a hard thing to hear. Now, what is interesting and intriguing to me is the, the exit strategy that God uses. Normally, in employment, if you will, when an individual has disqualified herself or himself from a position and it falls the responsibility of the, of the one to whom he or she answers to tell them, uh, usually they're through in a fairly quick period of time, if not that very day depending on the reason. But it's clear that he's not the one. It's clear that the Lord has removed the authority from him. It is clear that today it's over. But what isn't stated is the plan God has in mind. Uh, think of it. Saul remains king for an undetermined number of years, probably more like 12, maybe 13 more years. Think of it. So, he knows that there will be another better than he coming. He's already insecure, feeling guilty, ashamed, as he should have felt. In fact, if it wasn't felt before. The last words of chapter 15, look at that last sentence, the Lord regretted that he had made Saul king over Israel. Wouldn't you hate to ever think those words would ever have your name in them? It's a haunting thought. The Lord regretted that Saul had ever been appointed king. Now, Let's back away for a moment and let's remember the plan. Saul isn't the man. There will be a replacement. And all of this has happened without David's knowledge. David is simply keeping his father's sheep. He's in his mid-teen years. And the next chapter picks up the story as Samuel is on a search for the successor. Uh, you remember it. You've probably read it. He looks at all seven of the sons and asks, is this all? And Jesse, yeah, I got one more. Um, I'm the youngest in the family, so I don't know how that feels, you know. They, they, uh, especially if in, a, in a family of eight boys, uh, it, it, maybe Jesse, what, maybe David wasn't around that much. For sure, he's the last one Dave, uh, Jesse would have thought would have been the, the one to be anointed. And watch, that's often the way God does things. Uh, verse 12 of chapter 16, he sent and brought him in. This is the first description of David. He was ruddy, with beautiful eyes, a handsome appearance. And the Lord said, arise, anoint him, for this is he. Now, you and I know what's come before. David doesn't know anything. He's still sweaty from being out in the field with his sheep. He walks in. He has no idea who the old man is standing there with a flask of oil. And the next thing he knows, there's warm oil running down his neck. And words are said like, anoint him for this is he. But that's not all that happened. We read in the same verse, or, or the next verse, Samuel took the horn of oil, anointed him, and the Spirit of the Lord came mightily upon David from that day forward. Samuel arose and went to Ramah. Task completed. The rest will leave in the hands of the Lord. That's how they did it back then. He's been anointed the king. The next, he's the king-elect. No coronation. David goes back with the sheep. He doesn't run downtown and try on crowns. He, he do, it, it never dawns on him that there would be any time factor. I'm sure much of it wasn't really that clear to him. You will have moments in your life when there will be such surprises that it will sort of pass by you without you realizing the significance of the moment. He's going to be the king. 
Saul knows nothing of this. These are scenes altogether separate from each other as God is moving in significant ways in the lives of these who will be in places of leadership. Just as he's moving in your heart and mine, and as he will continue to move, you in one way, you in another, you in yet another, me in another, him in another, and her in another. We, God operates like that. And he is not obligated to communicate to anyone else what his plan is, even though he may plan to use one of us in the other's life. We don't know how all of that weaves together but it bundles together into a perfect plan. In this case, into a heartbreaking time of preparation. Because just as the Spirit of God comes upon David, verse 13, a spirit of evil comes on Saul and terrorizes him. Terrorizes him. Saul is never the same. He changes. Charles Ryrie in the study Bible says this, the evil spirit was used by God as the instrument of judgment on Saul, resulting in a mental disturbance bordering on madness. So now the king is not only threatened with the thought that one better than he will be taking the throne, never told when, just told it's, it, it's over, so he's now a lame duck serving in a capacity that has no declared ending, not realizing who the next person would be. And here is David, who's been keeping sheep most of his life, hearing words that seem so strange from a prophet he'd never known, and to muddle things even further, Saul now becomes mentally disturbed. Uh, before I go any further, just an addition here. If you have ever served along someone struggling with mental illness, emotional illness, you don't need any further explanation. If you haven't, you can't imagine the madness that accompanies the actions the reactions. In fact, um, we'll skip over the, the great chapter, chapter 17, where David kills the giant. And the folk song is written, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. And now Saul really is, is troubled. Here's this young upstart uh, of a shepherd who's killed a giant that Saul wasn't courageous enough to take on, and the people are loving David, this young hero of the land. And verse 8 of chapter 18, go there, begins the process of brokenness in David's life. Watch, 18.8. Uh, Saul became very angry. The saying displeased him. They've ascribed to David ten thousands. To me, they have ascribed thousands. You will work with people who will compare. And they will uh, see you as a threat. They will be suspicious of you. Your giftedness will work against you, especially if you are capable in areas where they are not and they hold a superior position. You got the picture. What more can he have but the kingdom? Remember, it's in the back of Saul's mind. The one statement he didn't want anybody to know about, but he's living with it. Look at verse 10. Look at the verb in the middle of the verse. He raved in the midst of the house while David was playing the harp with his hand. Verse 11, Saul hurled a spear at him. Remarkable. Verse 12, Saul was afraid of David. Verse 13, Saul removed him from his presence. Verse 15, he dreaded him. Saul is now becoming um, a case. 
H.G. Wells has an interesting line as a writer. One of his characters named Mr. Polly Wells writes, he was not so much a human being as a civil war. Saul has become his own civil war. He's paranoid. He's suspicious. He is angry. He is unable to sleep. He's raving. David is dodging spears. More than once, I took the time to mark in red in my Bible in these three chapters. He even plans to give, to give David one of his daughters. Before you get impressed with that, this is a bad woman he's going to give to David. And <laughs> verse 21, Saul thought, I will give her to him that she may become a snare to him. And that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Look, he's even hoping the enemies of Israel will, will wipe out this young whippersnapper. And if, if he doesn't, at least his new wife will make his life miserable enough to want to take it. <laughs> Verse 22. Speak to David secretly. So now there's secrecy. End of verse 25, Saul planned to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. Verse 29, Saul was even more afraid of David. Saul was David's enemy continually. Maybe you haven't lived long enough to have an enemy like that. Thank God if you have never known such a thing. Some enemies track you and stalk you. They hate you whether you're there or not. Their goal is to make your life miserable, is to ruin or weaken your ministry. Their hope is to put you down and watch you fall and deceptively maneuver and manipulate things to make sure that happens. This is Saul in David's life. Verse 19, Saul told Jonathan, verse 1 of chapter 19, Saul told Jonathan his son and all his servants to put David to death. How about that? Talk about distracted. He's now telling his own boy, you make sure there's a hitman that finishes him off. Verse 9 tells the story of another spear. Verse 10 says Saul tried to pin David to the wall with the spear. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him in order to put him to death. What am I doing? I am deliberately staying on it and staying on it like the physician puts his finger on the point of pain and presses and says, does that hurt? <laughs> and when you say it does, it, they never back off. They push harder. And that's what Saul's doing. That hurt? Now, you haven't felt anything yet. He's going to get David out of his life. What David can easily forget is that Saul is the tool being used by God to prepare him to king it. So that he will not be a Saul replacing Saul. My daughter, going through a terrible time right now in her life, said to me the other day, Daddy, I want you to read a book. She thought I'd read it before. I'd never heard of it. It's called A Tale of Three Kings, written by a man named Gene Edwards. I don't know if you've read it, but I, I, uh, I hope you do. It's a study of brokenness. Listen to a few excerpts. God has a university. It's a small school. Few enroll. Even fewer graduate, very, very few indeed. God has this school because he does not have broken men and women. Instead, he has several other types. He has those who claim to be God's authority and aren't broken. He has those who claim to be broken and aren't. And then there are those who are God's authority who are mad and unbroken. And he has, regretfully, a mixture of everything in between. In God's sacred school of submission and brokenness, why are there so few students? Because all who are in this school must suffer much pain. And as you might guess, it is often the unbroken ruler, don't miss this, 
It is often the unbroken ruler whom God sovereignly picks to mete out the pain. I've been engaged in three in five ministries in my life of some length. Uh, in three of the five ministries, I've had savages who had as their goal to make my life miserable. Um, I've also had individuals not involved in those ministries apart from those five places of service who for some reason chose to look with suspicion on my life. So I speak with some sense of knowledge in this. There was a time in my life when I would fight and uh, work hard at vindicating myself. Through a process of uh, years and the dregs of painful experiences, I have learned that I am unqualified to do that. Furthermore, I do not learn when I am busy about defending myself. It also distracts me from my calling, which is all part of the enemy's plan. It's easy to forget all of that when spears are coming your way. David had a question, this man continues to write. What do you do when someone throws a spear at you? Does it not seem odd to you that David did not know the answer to this question? After all, everyone else in the world knows what to do when a spear is thrown at them. Why? You pick up the spear and you throw it right back. When someone throws a spear at you, David, just wrench it right out of the wall and throw it back. Absolutely everyone else does that. You can be sure. And in doing the small feat of returning thrown spears, you will prove many things. You are courageous. You stand for the right. You boldly stand against the wrong. You are tough and can't be pushed around. You will not stand for injustice or unfair treatment. You are the defender of the faith, the keeper of the flame. You are the detector of all heresy. You will not be wronged. All of these attributes then combine to prove that you are also a candidate for kingship. Yes, perhaps you are the Lord's anointed after the order of King Saul. There is also a possibility that some 20 years after your coronation, you will be the most incredibly skilled spear thrower in all the realm, and most assuredly, by then, quite mad. When God wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible individual and crushes him. Has spears thrown at him. Has people say things about him that are not true. Brings out in his life Saul's. And other individuals who team together to finish you off. Now, why would I talk to you about this? I mean, some of you are just thinking about ministry. If, you, if you're looking for a reason not to get in, uh, you're, you're getting it today, aren't you? Uh, one of my favorite lines when someone tells me they're interested in ministry, I always, always say, if you could be happy doing anything else, do that. If you can't, then it's a calling. Walk in with your eyes wide open. I'm moved with a line in verse 3, chapter 20, the last part of it. Look at 20 and verse 3. There is hardly a step between me and death. That is... To use F.B. Meyer's words, ah me, this is pain. I think some of the people who are on this platform understand that line. I don't know that I'm, I've come that, to that, that place where there was just a step between me and death. There have been days when I would wish for death. It was so hard. But David means it literally. In, in fact, it gets so bad. 
it gets so bad, if you can believe it, that finally when it's clear and Jonathan says, my daddy's going to kill you, you got to know my daddy's going to kill you. Go. And David runs and makes his, makes, uh, his existence in the caves of En Gedi. If you ever go to Israel, be sure that somebody drives you near so you can walk up to the caves of En Gedi. He probably showered in the waterfall on the hillside. He lived his life for years in caves and dens. This is the king elect. This is the man who remembers the oil coming down the back of his neck. Living in a cave for years as Saul plans a way to finish him off. So you know where he winds up? He, look at the next verse. David came to Nob to Ahimelech. The priest of Ahimelech came trembling to meet David, said to him, why are you alone and no one with you? And David said to Ahimelech, the priest, the king has commissioned me with the matter and has said to me, let no one know anything about the matter on which I'm sending you and with which I've commissioned you. And I've directed the young men to a certain place, et cetera, et cetera. Verse 10. And David arose and fled that day from Saul and went to Achish, king of Gath. Gath. Guess who was from Gath? Goliath. This is Philistine territory. That's like Osama bin Laden hiding in the FBI headquarters. What is this? I mean, the people of Gath find out David, the giant killer, is now among them. They don't know anything about the spear throwing. They don't know nothing about the oil that's gone down his neck. They don't know anything about the plan of God. All they know is they've got this wild man in there. And look at what happens to David. <laughs> this is just incredible. Verse 13, he disguised his sanity before them. David acted insanely in their hands and scribbled on the doors of the gate and let his saliva run down into his beard. He's at the bottom of his life. This is our hero. Scribbling on a, scratching the door near the king of Gath's palace. Somebody said, you know, there's, there's somebody that would like to bring to you. I've always smiled when I read verse 15. The king says, do I lack madmen that you have brought this one to act the madman in my presence? Um, I got enough nuts. You don't I need to bring another one to me. <laughs> Here's the whole point. It is all designed to take away every crutch. He probably couldn't even name his brothers right by now. Maybe his daddy's dead. For all he knows, Jonathan's forgotten him. He is all alone. Cave dwelling does that to you. Your mind plays tricks on you. <laughs> and in your life, as in my life, Sunday comes. You'll learn Sunday comes every three days. It's like it never goes away. And you're on. And very few except your own spouse in the flock knows what you're going through. It's not something you take to the pulpit with you. Every crutch being removed. Why? Because it's God's school to break you down. When he wants to do an impossible task, he takes an impossible person and crushes him. One thing good about all this time is the Psalms he wrote. I haven't the time to read most of them, but turn to Psalm 35. I love it. Contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me, fight against those who fight against me. Notice where he takes the fight. He looks up. Contend with those who contend with me. Look at Psalm 54. This is a masquil of David when the Ziphites came and said to Saul, is not David hiding among us? 
Save me, O God, by your name. Vindicate me by your power. David's not out with a, um, uh, somebody defending him. He's all alone. He said, Lord, you do that for me. Hear my prayer, O God. Give ear to the words of my mouth. Look at chapter 55. Give ear to my prayer, O God. Do not hide you yourself from my supplication. I, in the middle of verse 2, I am restless in my complaint, and I am surely distracted. Of course he was. Verse 4, my heart is in anguish within me, and the terrors of death have fallen upon me. One more. 142. This is a masculine of David when he was in the cave. Listen to 142. I pour out my complaint before him. I declare my trouble before him. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, you knew my path. In the way where I walk, they have hidden a trap for me. Look to the right and see, for there's no one who regards me. There's no escape for me. No one cares for my soul. That's honest prayer. I have a friend who lost his precious little boy, and he drove the freeways of Los Angeles in the grief of that loss. And then it said, all the way through the night, for hours as I drove, I just screamed and I poured out my soul to God. I said things that I would never admit to anybody else. And I got back into my driveway and I was just dripping wet. And I turned my car off. And the thought hit me, the Lord can handle all of that. He'll never tell anybody. That's the kind of prayer that David's recording here. Help me. Help me. Just about the time he thinks it can't go on any further. Saul dies. Not once does David attempt to throw a spear at Saul. Not once does he retaliate. Isn't that great? And he's just 30 years old. And he's that mature. How? He graduated from the school of brokenness. As one man put it, one by one, God took them from me, all the things I valued most, until I was empty-handed. Every glittering toy was lost. And I walked earth's highways, grieving in my rags and poverty, till I heard his voice inviting, lift lift those empty hands to me. I turned my hands toward heaven, and he filled them with a store of his own transcendent riches till they could contain no more. And at last I comprehended with my stupid mind and dull that God cannot pour his riches into hands already full. I have no idea what God has for you, but I can assure you if his plan is to use you significantly, there will be Saul's in your life. There will be caves. And hopefully there will be psalms that come from that. Psalms of lament and brokenness that will help others who are just matriculating into the school. Let's bow our heads. While our heads are bowed, as if we have an altar right there in our lap in front of us, just place yourself before him. And just tell him, Lord, hold me close. Help me through these excruciatingly, penetratingly difficult days. 
keep my eyes fixed on you. Thank you, Father, for your faithful classroom work in the school of life. Just as Paul had his, had his Alexander, just as Moses had his Aaron and Miriam, just as Nehemiah had his Tobiah, Sanballat, and Geshem, just as David had his Saul, we all will be there. As you crush us, remold and make us that we might be effective, empty handed, open hearted instruments used for the Master in your way and in your time. For Jesus' sake. Everybody said,